Could you give me your name and your job title, please? Uh, Andrew Barberney, an Irish cricket captain. So I've been going through the list. Uh, William Porterfield is your fielding coach, and he played against the West Indies. You won that series. If that isn't a microcosm of how weird Irish cricket has been over the last little while, it seems that uh, it seems like the last year has been one of the weirdest years in Irish cricket. Has it felt that way as as a player? Um, it hasn't. Not really as a player. I think um, the only time it felt weird was the most recent uh, week we were away playing and I was sitting in the hotel room watching the guys go about it uh, really well um, as hard as it was it was kind of really pleasing to see a couple of guys stand up and and uh, put in performances to win games um, but yeah there's certainly been a, a lot going on sort of behind the scenes in terms of the coaching staff and people being appointed and you know we have a head coach coming in about uh, well when we get back from our next trip uh, a new head coach will be in place and so hopefully once the kind of summer starts, there'll be a lot more stability and we know where, where we are in terms of a coaching group. You, you talked before about COVID and how it's affected you and everything. Obviously, the USA West Indies series was sort of blighted by both of those things. As a professional athlete, like you're not really used to sitting on your bum uh, not doing much. But did, did it affect you psych- psychologically? Um, it did, um, and I think it affected a lot of us. Um, I think it, it's more so the, the the such regular testing regime of it all um, and not knowing whether you've got the virus or not. Um, certainly, you know, I had one bad day with the virus in terms of a, a really bad cold, but, you know, it was nothing compared to waiting for a test result or having to spend time in your room when you're not actually ill. So um, we actually chatted as a group um, sort of, after the first ODI when there was a couple more cases and, and there were guys genuinely concerned. We didn't want, we still had a, a number of tests to complete before we left and, and guys didn't want to test positive two days before traveling home and then having to stay out there. And so we had some good honest chats and, and, and hopefully going forward, there will be a change. Um, you know, certainly things have changed a bit in Ireland in the last week in terms of restrictions. Um, you know, I've said before that sometimes as players you do feel like pawns um, on a chessboard and you're being moved around and, you know, you know, usually the, the best thing about cr- being a professional cricketer is the touring. And unfortunately at the moment that's actually becoming the worst thing because you have to do so many tests and you're restricted to your hotel and, you know, you've no family out there with you like you usually would. So um, hopefully we might see a change in the next sort of six to 12 months when we go abroad. And just to explain it for everyone, you were in the USA, then you're in the West Indies, you're in Ireland at the moment, and you're about to head to Oman. Have I got all those things right? I mean, that, that seems pretty crazy considering you're in a pandemic. Yeah, it does. Um, we've actually probably played more than maybe we did pre-pandemic. If you look at the, the 50 over Super League, we've pro- I think we've played maybe the most games out of everyone, um, which has been great, great for this team. It's a format that we've obviously had pretty good success and we've done well at. Um, but yeah certainly it was strange because the USA there was a managed environment and you were able to go out and about you know as long as you weren't going inside venues but we were still doing the same amount of testing so I don't know whether that balance was right Um, I think you've probably got to go one or the other Um, and then we moved on to the West Indies where it was a strict bubble guys were then picking up COVID when in the bubble and it was just it was it was carnage for a while Um, the, the fact that we managed to get out of it with a series win was was amazing all things considered but yeah two weeks at home um and then off to oman next friday so we'll have another test probably next wednesday to to get on the plane and 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 we go again yeah i don't want to see what the inside of your nose looks like i mean i didn't want to see what the inside of your nose looked like before but yeah less so now um it's interesting because you talk about how much cricket and 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 i certainly feel like ireland's playing more cricket now than they were before and, and it's interesting that you said the same but I did work out recently that I've been to 66% of your test matches. Um, and I haven't left the house in two years, mate, if we're being completely honest. Um, did you think being a test nation would be different than this? Did you think there would be more opportunities? Or is this kind of what Ireland thought might happen when they started test cricket? Um, it's certainly not what I expected. Um, I've been fortunate to be at 100% of... Uh, the test matches although I wasn't really at the first one you weren't um, at the first one <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah no it, it's certainly not what I envisaged those two and a half days at Lords were what you expected test cricket to be and that is 
that I think certainly the highlight of my career was was getting to be there and, and take the field with the other ten guys that on that occasion and, and that's where you that's where you're like okay we finally got to where we've been striving to get to and like you said I know COVID has come into it but you know everyone else who's a test member has played two or three times at least since uh, COVID um, and we haven't and look it's a frustration that I've aired on, nu on numerous occasions and I'll continue to until we get those test matches because it's the best format it's the purest format you know there's there's so much test cricket on at the moment that you you know it's it's great to watch but at the same time you want to be part of it and and our careers aren't long um and you you know I'm 31 now and I like to think that I'm near or at the the peak of my career and I want to be playing test cricket I want to lead Ireland into a test match I want to do all those things but the the opportunities aren't there we're due to play one in Zimbabwe I think but who knows the way it's gone I'm not getting my hopes up just yet um so I want to talk about this this last year because I, I I do think Irish cricket has been quite fascinating. Probably the ups and downs that you've had over the last year has has been so so you know wildly different. So the, you play South Africa at home. Uh, both those games are at Malahide. There was supposed to be three. Was one washed out? Am I remembering? Yeah, the that? first game was washed out. We battled for about forty five overs, I think. That's right. Yeah. So so the next two games, you so you win that first game, and the elation of being able to win against. Uh, South Africa at home in Malahide that must have been huge for you, for you guys uh, it was massive um, I, I remember we had a group chat after the Netherlands series that we had lost prior to that and you know we had just lost 2-1 in a series that you know we probably should have won we, we lost the first game by a run but you know we didn't win so we I remember having a pretty honest chat we had an open honest chat and the talk around the group was still pretty positive and there was certainly a belief that if we did play good cricket, um, we could compete with teams like South Africa. So leaving the Dutch series, there was still a confidence that we could do something like that, even though we, you know, naturally you'd be fairly low after losing any series, but particularly to a team that are ranked fairly close to you. So yeah, we got to Malahide and, you know, I think we took a lot of confidence from the first game that was washed out. We got into a pretty good position. Um, we were maybe, I actually couldn't even tell you the score, but we, we had batted pretty well and, you know, they had a pretty good seam attack. And I think that just kind of sent a bit of confidence through the group. Um, and then the second game, I think we got put in um, on a, a relatively greenish wicket and we got a score. Uh, we got, I think, 280 or 290 and we bowled and fielded out of our skin. And it was the first series um, we had had in Dublin with, pe with people back in the crowd. So friends and family were there. And it was just a really kind of special occasion. And for the young group to go out and do what they did um, just showed that this team was capable of great things if if we performed on a consistent basis you know that consistency is still probably lacking a bit and we need to try to work a way out to, to get that but certainly those sort of performances and, and even the England one before that the year before showed to the group and you know the players below us that um, we are able to kind of compete with the best on a regular basis so the england one obviously was it was weird because it was kind of in the middle of the first covid and it was you know in england's second team this was essentially south africa's best team obviously you know give or take a couple of players but no teams ever completely full it also felt like it was a proper tour like they had come to play you and you had beaten them it's not it wasn't tacked on or or anything like that i was wondering if is there something about it felt for you guys it must have been incredible you get to play in front of a crowd you beat a major team in malahide but did, is it also starting to feel a little bit more like no we should beat these teams so it's a it, it's a normal thing for us to be able to do we you know we are a, a a fully functioning team these we can't over um celebrate these wins the way that we probably did once upon a time yes yeah, certainly and i think that's what's been such a big bonus for this cricket world cricket league because previously you'd maybe play south africa in one game and, mm -hmm. and and like that first ODI it gets washed out and you don't really know if you can compete at that level if you get three games against them you have a chance well you have three chances um and you know the third game was was, was a bit of a a really kind of disappointing one because we had done so well in the in the second game but even someone like Simi Singh coming and scoring 100 and batting at eight um the confidence that that gave the group as well um but I think just having those three games knowing that you're going to get three quality games against the top opposition rather than just one game in may maybe one in july and one in august if you're lucky 
it's hard to kind of put something together or put a performance together as a group so um you know i think that's why i'm such a fan of of the super league and it's a shame that it's it's going to change next year but um it certainly has been an up and down super league for us we've had some amazing days and then some pretty poor three games or, or two games in the series uh, so that South Africa series was also the time you started using Andy McBride at number three, of which I don't know if you've seen my piece, but I'm. I I'm, did. I, well, my dad, my dad read it as well yesterday, and he was <laughs> talking to me about it. I, I find the whole thing so fascinating because I can see why, and I also know that obviously Gary Wilson has an influence there, and that he's been doing it, for, you know, regionally as well. <laughs> but the whole thing is so bizarre that you've you've ended up with a top six with two essentially frontline bowlers. Are you are you not even worrying about that? Are you just going? These are our six best batters, or how tactical are you getting with all of this? Are you trying to make sure that you have more bowling options in the team, or what's the thinking behind Andy McBride in, in the top order? Well, it was it came about in that South Africa series. Um, the morning of the second game, William Porterfield had had an infection in his finger, in his thumb, and like I think it was really bad in the first game, but he kind of battled through and got a fifty. It was remarkable. Like you'd want to see the size of his thumb. It got really bad on that morning and it was kind of like I woke up to the message from Graham Ford and William Porterfield at half seven or eight saying, you know, I'm no good. Ford is like, we need to fill this gap here. So it was it was last minute. So it wasn't I wouldn't say it was tactical or planned. It was we didn't want to shift the the kind of Harry Tector was at four and he's kind of he's he's finding his way and he's doing really well at four. We didn't want to nudge him up. Now, I was happy to open because at three, I, I think it's similar enough. So I didn't want to kind of adjust the middle order because they were fairly settled. You know, you have Curtis Camfer um, coming in at five. So we thought the four and five was pretty solid. And you had Andy McBride, who was probably down to about eight. Um, and I remember texting him straight away going, you know, do you fancy batting three? You know, I, I know Andy pretty well. I know his game pretty well. He's, he, he's probably too good to be batting nine, as he's probably showed, but... It was, it was really just, I thought, would be a quick fix for one game. Um, and Andy's response was, actually, do you want me to open? That was his first reply. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I'll open. I'll go up top. You just, you just go to three. And he played really well. He got 30-odd. Um, I remember he had hit a couple of boundaries off Shamsi. And, you know, I kind of said, "Good, o this is a good over. Like, keep going. And he said something about a reverse sweep. And I was like, don't know about that. And eventually he went for it, missed it. It was LB. But... He had played really well and done the job really well um, coming in at three and got 30 odd and um, he obviously did it against South Africa again South Africa again in that third game I don't think he went as well but it came round to Jamaica um, and Sterlow obviously missed the first game so it was literally because I didn't know I was going to get COVID I was like we need one person we need this is for one game so Scra you go up to three again and, and just do the job you did during the summer um, I played really well again. Um, got thirty odd and head butted one, um, and then went off. So and then I obviously went down, and that was just uh, because he he had done it pretty well, and the guys were playing well around him at four and five, and um, we just thought that that made sense. Whether it'll be a long term thing, I'm not sure, um, but certainly if we do have an emergency, we know that he can come in and do that job really really well. Is there a wor worry slightly about the depth of your batting that, that you have had to sort of... I, I know that, you know, I mean, well, Porterfield's sort of half retired, half not retired, um, half coach um, situation. Obviously, you and Sterlo, uh, Sterlo's probably got a couple more years and you've got quite a few more years. But is there a bit of a worry with the batting depth in general, do you think, in that side? It just doesn't look as solid to me as, as I feel an Irish lineup normally would. Yeah, look, and, and the Irish lineup that I, I suppose you're probably thinking of featured Niall O'Brien, Ed Joyce, Kevin O'Brien, Gary Wilson, um, serious players, guys mm -hmm. who, who week in, week out, were doing well at county cricket. Um, but we've got to find these these young guys, and we don't have a, we probably don't have as good a, an A programme as we should to kind of make sure that the gap is, is, is bridged. So we have to find ways to, to make sure that this team is scoring big runs um we've we've done that pretty well i think um Sterl obviously had an amazing year last year that makes a big difference he does make a big difference to the to the side when he when he's going well um george dockrell is someone who's come in and, and and kind of transformed his game into a batter we've players like gareth delaney who we're still trying to find out what he can give us in a 50 over kind of format but 
I think we certainly have maybe seven or eight solid good batters who can do a job. It's just making sure that through the years that there's maybe 15 you can choose from or or more. And uh, and that is having a, a really good a, a system in place so that guys are going week in, week out and, and playing against top A teams and, and doing well. And you can bring them in um, whenever fit. But um, yeah, look, it's, it's, there's no secret that it's not as... The, the batting maybe isn't as deep as it was, but certainly that West Indies series, when you see people like Harry Tector doing what he did, what Curtis Camfer can do, um, I think there is a bit more depth, but we certainly have to try to make it as deep as possible. So the South African series is obviously, uh, you know, ends up one all, but as you said, it feels like a proper series for the first time. You guys win at home in front of a crowd. Next sort of major thing that you're involved in is, is the World Cup. Uh, so you're in that weird thing that the ICC have the pre-tournament tournament um, part of the World Cup uh, first game starts brilliantly you basically win the first game in four balls because of Curtis Kampfer who I think if, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correct he had like 20 or 30 professional wickets in his life before he took four wickets in four balls <laughs> um, that game I, you know you and you, you've been involved in a lot of T20 cricket obviously I've worked in it as well that almost feels like not, not, a, not a fluke game but like you can't replicate that anyway but you leave that game on a bit of a high, I'm assuming. Absolutely. We knew it was a, a crucial game. Um, you know, the history with ourselves and the Dutch and T20 cricket had lent towards them in previous years. Um, it, it was interesting going into the World Cup. I remember looking down at the 11 and I remember thinking there was only two, maybe two players or three players who had played in World, in a World Cup in T20 cricket. Uh, that was my first game uh, in a T20 World Cup. I hadn't played in 2016. I was on the bench. Um, and I don't. I think that was the last one. It was yeah in India. Mm. Um, so it was kind of we, there was nerves around, no doubt. It was a huge game. Um, our T Twenty form had been inconsistent, and it has been for a while. It obviously showed in that tournament, but certainly that Curtis over was like they they had built a bit of a partnership. I think Ackerman and I can't remember who else it was, but yeah, I mean when you get four wickets in an over, that's you're doing well to to lose a game from there. So. We chased a pretty low total comfortably enough and we we were set up nicely for the rest of the week. Um, and yeah, look, I suppose everyone knows how it went in the end, but um, certainly the confidence was high after that kind of first game. I mean, it flows into the next game. You had Sri Lanka eight for three. Um, at, you know, you, you were probably hoping for, I mean, I can't think of too many teams who win a T20 game where they're eight for three. Um, did you lose that game in the field or was it just the sort of hasaranga and, and the spinners that, that, that got you? Um, yeah, did we lose it in the field? I think we could have maybe been a bit more attacking and that's maybe partly down to me. Um, I think we, at eight for three, we maybe could have gone for the jugular um, and we didn't. Um, but I suppose we were still chasing a total we thought was chaseable on a pretty good wicket under lights. Um, we knew that they had a a couple of quicks and Hasaranga, who's who's a high quality T20 bowler. Um, the, the chase just never got going. Um, I think we lost Sterling Kev in the power play, if I'm not mistaken, um, and we were always playing catch up from there. Um, it's just a shame because we felt at the halfway stage we felt that that was you know that was a chaseable total. Um, but certainly at eight for three, we you know we probably and you know I kind of put my hand up. We could have maybe attacked a bit more and. Um, maybe taking a couple of wickets and kill the game there. That Sri Lankan <laughs> middle order wasn't particularly well known at that point as well. Did that play into you? You know, just thinking, well, they, if you if you come in against a Sri Lankan middle order that you know a lot about, you probably you know uh, back yourself a little bit more. But it felt in this particular situation like there wasn't a. Uh, I mean, it wasn't until halfway through the tournament we all realised that that they were building something good. Was did that have any effect on you or? Um, I, I think look we did our homework but at the same time um, at 8 for 3 the juices are flowing and I think it was Hasarango who came in and that kind of took us that kind of threw us off guard a bit and um, he started playing really well and, and just completely counter attacked and I suppose that's T20 cricket when you play against those top teams who play a lot of T20 cricket you have to expect that and, and maybe we could have slowed it down a bit and, and, and thought a bit more clearer but I think they played pretty well as well um, you have to kind of give them credit um, but you know I think we bowled and fielded I mean we could have bowled and fielded a lot better than we did but um, like I said at the halfway point we were still pretty happy with how we'd gone even though we had the made for three at the start 
Uh, Namibia game, obviously, probably not one you want me to, uh, to bring up too much, but that game, you look tentative to me in that game. Like, I, I would still say, if, if you guys played them, you know, 20 times, I'd still say that you would come out on top 13 or 14 times, like, um, that you're, you're better all-round side than Namibia. I think Namibia is great. They're what I call a low-mistake team. They, they just wait for the op- other team to make mistakes, but just felt like you guys were just a little bit timid. Was that just a pressure thing, or did they just maybe get a little bit ahead in the game early on against you? Um, it was, look, it was certainly the batting the way we started i think we had, we started really well and the, the platform was sort of set and kind of from myself down to the the rest of the guys no one really went to the run a ball and that was just crucial and we just we, we weren't smart with how we batted um whether you know whether it's, we thought that we had to just score boundaries to to keep the score going um on a wicket that was really slow and tired it was the sort of wicket where you know you you go six or seven and over and then go hard at the end just make sure that the scoreboard was ticking but we went through a phase and, and that's when I was out there where the scoreboard just looked like it wasn't moving and that's that's a hard place to be in especially in such a big game like that you do feel the, the kind of extra pressure and but in saying that we got to a total that after the power play um, with the ball we thought that we were really in the game there was a, there was a huge DRS decision we didn't go for um, it was kind of it was all happening because Mark had Mark got injured as the ball. I was at midwick, and I was like, "That looks very, that looks very adjacent." But I had, the, you know, two or three lads were just saying, "Oh, he's hit it." And then Sparky was injured, so I was like, "Okay, he's hit it. Are you all right, Sparky?" And then I just remember hearing from fine leg Kev roaring, "Oh, it's hitting all three as he's looked at the screen," and I was just like, "Oh, this might not be our day." But you have to take a hat off to them. I thought Erasmus, their skipper, um, batted really well. He just played the situation so well. And they had someone like David Visa to come in and just to kill the game when he did. But that was a really low point. That week post the World Cup, I certainly I didn't watch a game for 10 days. Um, I remember my fiance was working from home and she always has the cricket on in the background to, to just kind of keep her company. And I was like, well, you can put on the football highlights because we're not, we're not watching the cricket. Um, and it was really tough because I'd been part of a, a, 20, a World Cup in 2015 and they're so special and the platform it is for, for some of our younger guys and um, to be on and, and play against the best in the world, um, it would have been brilliant, but it didn't happen and that's the game and the ups and downs, like you, like you said, that year was just it was surreal and the ups and downs. Um, we had some really amazing highs, but we kind of finished off the year with that, uh, with that really low one. And the other thing is like for Irish cricket before, every World Cup was the biggest thing in the world, which I suppose the World Cup should be, but because you were playing so little regular cricket against big teams at other times, because as you say, even when you play against the big team, it's quite often one game, you know, they're coming out to England and they tackle one day or on, it might even rain out. Usually World Cups are very big. This isn't quite the same now because you play so much cricket at the moment, you're used to playing bigger teams. But I would assume that for Irish fans, that sort of you're still building towards something. So to have such a down, to, to not qualify, and also to have a team like Namibia um, beat you to that qualification must have been, you know, almost a double blow. Um, yeah, uh, it, it certainly is different now. We we play a lot of fixtures. We probably don't play enough T Twenty cricket. And <clears throat> you, you talk about the big teams. I think for us, particularly in T Twenty cricket, we need to play as much cricket as possible, and that. And that doesn't matter who it's against. Um, a lot of the teams now are, are catching up in T20 because, you know, naturally that is the format that they prioritise. We weren't prioritising T20 because of the World Super League. That's shifted slightly now because of the change in um, format of the Super League and the relegation and, and all that's out the window now. So um, there's no doubt that 50 over cricket probably was prioritised and over the last year or two um, but we've got to get better at T20 cricket because that, that, that game is only moving quicker and there's only going to be more opportunities and, and leagues around the world for guys to play in and you know we, we, are, we are a confident team but certainly in T20 cricket there is that inconsistency that we've shown in the last 12 to 18 months probably since I think since the pandemic we, uh, we didn't play any T20 cricket in 2020 post pandemic we played Zimbabwe and South Africa last year in T20 cricket, and then we had the build up to to the UAE. But we need to play, be playing a lot more. And and it, like I said, it doesn't matter who it's against, as long as the guys are playing 
consistent T20 cricket to know how to do their roles on a more regular basis rather than just kind of having a few fixtures here and a few fixtures there. So um, that's why I think we have, we have three games leading into the qualifiers next week. So hopefully once that starts, we'll, we'll be able to hit the ground running. Is it, you know, other than playing a lot, which obviously is very helpful, is there anything else you think you need to do for, before the next World Cup? I think, you know, our own intro uh, structure needs to improve. We need to have more games on better wickets. That's something that I've been talking about for a long time. Um, we were fortunate at the back end of 2020 that a few of us were able to go over and play in the blast. That was brilliant. Myself, Gareth Delaney, um, Paul Sterling was there anyway. But um, those sort of experiences, we have Josh Little who has just started playing in a couple of the leagues now and he's getting better and better and, and you know he's only going to he could in my opinion he could be Ireland's greatest ever bowler he's got that much talent and that much skill and he and he's you know he works very hard and he's a student of the game um so we need to keep keep creating cricketers like that who you know t20 cricket is their kind of their format um a lot of us were brought up in 50 over cricket and and that's where we kind of learned our trade and you know a few of us went over to county cricket and played longer formats and we maybe particularly younger guys, I think they just need to be exposed to T20 cricket more regularly. It doesn't matter if that's international or domestic, just need to be playing in, in that format as much as possible. The next series that you played in, oh, sorry, it's probably not the next series. You guys have played in so many series. I'm probably skipping about 30 um, series here. But the next sort of major one where I was paying attention, which are the only ones that matter, Andy, as yeah. you know, yeah. uh, was the USA series. It felt to me at that stage, and it's really the reason I got you on the podcast, is you, you, know, you win a game against South Africa, you have the bad World Cup, you then struggle against uh, the USA, and then obviously you go on um, against the West Indies. The USA obviously is not the same USA that we saw even two or three years ago. I think they did well against Scotland a couple of years ago um, with a bunch of other players. But obviously it's building towards something else, towards minor league cricket, major league cricket, and all these sorts of things. But at the same time, for a test-playing nation, it's a bit of a kick in the teeth to lose games to the USA, isn't it? It is, and you know, we, I've been playing in Irish teams where the roles were reversed, and we were the team beating the the full member um, and surprising them. Um, it was certainly, a, you know, a pretty a pretty scrappy game. The first game, uh, we just never got going. We we started well with the ball, and and they put on a, a ridiculous partnership. And I think our the back. 10 overs went for over 100 and we just that's kind of been our Achilles heel I think when we've been on tours is we never really start well and we kind of get into the groove like two games maybe three games in and it's something we've tried to address and we need to keep addressing because it doesn't seem to get any better the second game was actually a really big win for us because it was a proper scrap and it was kind of it reminded me of the Irish teams that I grew up watching that scrap for every single run whether with batter in the field and it's something that maybe I wouldn't say has gone missing but when you grow up playing against you know your your fellow associates or your fellow kind of minnow I don't like that word but you play grow up playing Scotland and Holland the teams you've you've always played with you absolutely scrap and you know I kind of remember watching Irish teams with William Porterfield and Trent Johnson and John Mooney proper scrappers and I don't think we'd ever been in that scrap and, and and it's probably you know it, it would have been exactly what we needed in in that namibia game and i i remember mentioning it after the game i was like we're going to play a lot of these games where we have to go out and we have to make sure that we scrap for every run because we're not the we're, we're nowhere near the finished article in t20 we don't have the hitters that other teams have but we can have that passion and we can have that pride about playing um for ireland um and that's why that get, second game was really pleasing because we were down and out at one stage. I think they started really well with the bat and we really needed to scrap and it took a run out from Curtis to kind of get us going and, and Curtis puffed the chest out. And and I know it was a USA game and you know got, people will, will, like people in Ireland wouldn't have known that game was going on, but they know the West Indies game and the South Africa games are going on. But I think for the group, that second US win was, was quite a big win for us, certainly from my opinion anyway. It's also weird if you think of the situation of Irish cricket. A, most of you guys did grow up watching a team that was nowhere near as professional as this, that was mostly county players and, you know, top-up players uh, from, from local cricket. Obviously, you know, you, you're now the test captain, so it's a, you know, 
no, that's that's an honor. That's a that's a huge thing. To not do. yet, not yet. Well, sorry, you will be the test captain when there is a test play. <laughs> um, you know, if you can hang on uh, to the next <laughs> one. But but you know, it's it's really weird because you're in a position now, and this is great for world cricket. But you're in a position now where the strongest associate teams can still, you know, ruin your day. And, but you can also beat some of you know some of the uh, you know the major more major teams than you. It's really interesting that you can sort of punch up and punch down. It's actually hard to, for you guys to get a real thought process of where you are as a team at some stage. You know, to beat South Africa. I know it's two different formats, but to beat South Africa in one format and to lose to the USA in the other one. Um, both of those are you and I follow enough cricket now to know that those are both reasonable uh, results. But psychologically, as a team, you must be going, "How the hell do we beat South Africa like that?" And then come up against the USA uh, um, and go like that. Like, is there, is there, you know, does is that play with your minds a little bit as a team? Um, I think it's it's kind of a testament to how the game is growing and how um, how teams are just getting better. And you know, there's always this kind of test bracket and the rest and the associates. But I don't like certainly being on the kind of border of that. Um, you understand the team like Scotland, Holland. Um, Oman, Papua New Guinea, Namibia. These teams are good cricket teams, and and we're a good cricket team. But you know, if we don't turn up, if we don't play good cricket, we're going to lose to these teams. And the guys are fully aware of that, and they're also aware of if we play good cricket against the good teams, we'll also win. So, um, like I said, we're on that sort of border. But um, you know, we have no right to win any game of cricket. Um, so you know, rankings and all that, and expectation. Um, you know, I, I really do hate the, you know, they're a full member, they're a, test, they're a test nation, they should be winning. But, you know, we, a lot of these teams we play have better infrastructures than we do um, and are playing probably more cricket or T20 cricket than we are. But um, certainly we do have players that should be performing better um, at that level. Um, but I just, I really enjoy the challenge. I enjoy the challenge of one week going out and facing some of the best bowlers in the world. And then going to a place like Oman and playing their spinners and like it's it's great it's it's such a unique job that we get to go to so many parts of the world and and see the progression of teams um, and and they're just getting better and um, we've got to get better and the guys understand that and and hopefully over the next year or two we can kind of show people that consistency that we're craving. Let's get to the good bit then. West Indies tour. Uh, we've already talked about it. The COVID and. Um, you know, bringing, bringing your coach off the bench and all the sort of the nonsense that went on. You know, as, as scrappy and as good as some of the island teams were back in the day, if, if they had to play in those sorts of conditions, you, you know, you would expect that uh, a team like the West Indies would probably still have rolled you. Now, obviously, you had, uh, you know, some incredible luck when it came to the toss, um, but you still, you know, uh, dominated that series. Did anything change in that series? Is it just some things are coming together or was it um you know just you know maybe even just a bit of luck you know was there any different feeling going into that series than you've had in some of the others um <clears throat> that's a good question i think 50 over cricket like i said is our best format at the moment out of the two formats it's it's a get it's a format that we know pretty well the guys know their roles really well and we have fairly established player now players now in terms of you know sterling Myself have nearly played. Well, I've played maybe eighty games. Andy McBride, George Dockrell, like Mark Adair, and like we're we're building something pretty good in fifty over cricket. So we we knew that we could beat them in a series, and and we made sure that that message was clear from the off. Um, it's funny looking back. You know, we got released from quarantine the night we won the third game, and I remember sitting down with a couple of lads, and we were talking. We were actually talking about how we should have really won the get series three now from the position we were in in the first game um, needing 100 with 9 wickets left um, so coming back from that real disappointment and then for games to be postponed for us to lose players we were one you know we were one COVID case from Gary Wilson putting the gloves back on because you know Neil Rock had to come in and we had no other keepers um, we may even have got Niall down from the commentary box um, <laughs> but that's the state it was in and, and it was almost so chaotic that the guys were just so keen to get out and play cricket and get out of the hotel and get out from the the COVID hotel or whatever we were calling it. Um, and yeah, I think it was just the belief. Um, we got over the line in the second game and there was certainly, like I said, the first game, we, we fully thought that we could beat them. 
and and that's that's something that I've you know I've been in Irish teams playing higher ranked teams and where that maybe hasn't been there and for it to be there from a young group you know people like Harry Tactor the way he played Josh Little um, it just kind of clicked and um, it was huge confidence taken from that um, and it's just such a shame that we didn't pull off a couple of wins in other series where we let ourselves down a bit and we could be in with a real chance of qualifying automatically but I think that's still in our hands so that's obviously a good thing to take how did that go in Ireland obviously in in a World Cup right we, we know when Ireland wins a World Cup game against you know any major nation but even the smaller nations there's you know there's always a ripple in Ireland of what happens this is a bilateral series um it's away from home um good time zone though to be fair for the Irish fans so yeah, yeah. they certainly got to see it but ha- how did that go down you know West Indies cricket is uh you know not in its strongest state it's probably it, you know you talk about your best format being one day cricket their worst format's probably one day cricket at the moment they're, they're probably best in test cricket and 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 then t20 cricket but um you know how did that go down with the Ireland fans because it just felt like a historic a moment uh, for Irish cricket yeah it did and for it to happen at Sabina Park where the, the whole kind of adventure um, you know there's been cricket in Ireland and Irish cricket teams bef- way before Sabina Park in 2007 but that was the catalyst for where we are now earning money to play cricket professionally in, in the country it, you know I, I remember chatting to my dad and, and actually my, my future father-in-law and, and they grew up listening to West Indies on, on the radio, listening to the great West Indies teams playing, you know, going to England and, and hammering them. And and for us as an Irish team to actually go to the West Indies and beat them in a series, it, I think it's been quite hard to comprehend for a couple of Irish fans because it's such a it's such a um, amazing achievement. It's it's something that you know, we haven't had too many opportunities to, to win away from home in series. Um, Particularly against you know Afghanistan, we've had pretty good rivalry over the years. But but a team and like the West Indies, you mentioned it there. They, it's not their strongest um, format, but it's still the West Indies. Um, and you know when you think about all the great West Indies players and teams, um, for us to go over there with you know a pretty deflated squad and and do what we did is just. I'd like to think that there'll be a knock-on effect um, in Ireland in terms of participants, but we'll only probably see that throughout the summer. Um, I, I remember going down to Cork before Christmas to one of the clubs and helping them open their um, kind of indoor centre. And there is a there is a huge love for the game in the country. Um, and I've always said that we're we're in the best position to to show off cricket in Ireland because we're on the world stage regularly. So if we can produce results and, and series wins like that it's only going to have a knock-on effect this year um uh, other than playing a test match what what are the sort of goals for irish cricket this year well first and foremost it's to make sure that we're we're in australia in october um i think it's october or end of september um I, you know i went to a world cup in 2015 and in australia and still to this day is is one of the great places to tours in my to tour in my opinion there's a huge irish contingent um in australia so you know that's that's first and foremost that's top of the list in my opinion um out of everything we have this year um we're still not 100 percent sure what our fixture list looks like um you know there's there's talks of series is we're due to play the new zealand and bangladesh in the world super league at home um so certainly the confidence we can take from the the West Indies tour, if we can turn those two over um, in Dublin, that'd be a huge achievement. But I, I don't think we can look too far past the next kind of month because um, that dictates a lot of what's going to happen in the next year. Um, if we qualify for the World Cup in Australia, we'll potentially have a lot of T20 fixtures leading up to that. If we don't, um, God forbid, I'm not sure what will happen in terms of T20 cricket this summer, but um, certainly I don't think... I, I think it'd be naive to look any anywhere past um, Oman over the next month. Well, there's certainly no more like-for-like situation than uh, Oman when you're trying to qualify for a tournament in Australia. So that's yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. very, very similar conditions. If you do qualify, it will help you so much playing all that cricket <laughs> yeah, yeah. in Oman. Um, it's very much like uh, Gabba. Um, thanks for coming on, man. Uh, Pleasure. Is, is there any, anything... In, in, uh, actually, I just want to ask you one last question just before you go. 
you you have we talked about this on a previous podcast you were very honest about how it took you a long time to get going with your career um over the last couple of years you've been in, in brilliant form just you personally uh you know in that world cup you clearly weren't at your best i don't know what your strike rate was i'm not even going to say it. even if i remembered it i wouldn't say it because it, <laughs> it, really was, it wasn't good <laughs> For you personally, as as a player, you, you talked about um, hitting your peak. What do what are your, some of your goals outside of just being a captain and just making runs again? Um, my goals are just keep scoring as many runs as possible. Um, you know, I kind of look at hundreds as, when fifty over cricket. I want to score as many hundreds as possible. I think Paul Sterling is certainly leading that in terms of hundreds, and I want to get to where he's got to. Um, and I think just contributing to wins. Um, and I've always said that as a captain, I want my bat to do the talking. Um, like you said, it wasn't it wasn't good enough in in um, in the World Cup in in the UAE. Um, but you know, I've been working really hard at T Twenty cricket. It's it, it's the kind of format where I feel like I need to kind of play as much as possible to give myself a bit of rhythm and and form. And you know, I've had pretty good success in Oman, so hopefully I can continue to do to do that. But um, certainly just winning game I, we've said it as a group um winning games for ireland with the batter with the ball is there's no better feeling so as long as i'm kind of contributing to wins um i'll be fairly happy i think thanks for coming on the podcast pleasure thanks jared